I see that's interesting in Q&A you can't type back your answer you have to just kind of reply with the audio right no you can no. also type answer hmm I don't get that option you, you can type your answer probably best I don't try you you might be thinking of the chat window I'm thinking the Q&A no, in no, Q &A, not Q &A. I got type answer. I have a button. Looks like total answer. novices, guys. <laughs> what? Okay, well, yeah, Ivan, you'll be presenting, so we'll let, you know, they seem to be able to, to type, so I think that's... Um... Anyway, well, everyone, it's, it's noon, uh, so I think we should get started here. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in to the second edition uh, of VMAX. Uh, we're very excited today. I'm just going to go over quickly again, the, the ground rules and how we're gonna set things up. And then uh, I'll hand it over to Morton Robin, who's gonna be uh, our moderator for today, who will introduce uh, everyone else. Uh, I just wanna say for attendees, right now you are all muted in terms of your video and your audio. Your video will be muted for the entire session. We have no way to, to turn that on. So don't worry about that happening. Or when we have substantive Q and A at the end, we will have people posing questions with audio we will notify you privately through chat before we would call on you and, and allow you to speak but and you will have ultimate control over unmuting yourself so we will not, not in any way unmute you so we will let you know first we will allow you to talk and then you will have to actively unmute yourself so you know we're not going to be listening into anyone's uh microphone uh, at this time uh and i want to say you know we're going to have a zero tolerance policy for abuse and, questions or chat that we view as abusive, you'll be immediately removed from the webinar uh, and not allowed to return. So we want to promote uh, a productive research environment here. That being said, so if you have some uh, questions, you can put them through the, the text Q&A. Uh, the, the other panelists will try to answer them uh, kind of on the fly, particularly for clarifying questions and substantive questions will defer again to the Q&A at the end. Okay, so without further ado, uh, Morton Robin is gonna be our moderator for today and he is going to introduce uh, the panelists and presenter. So welcome everybody. So it's great to host this uh, second event in VMAX and uh, we continue the theme of the crisis uh, with a paper co-authored by, uh, by four stars, uh, Veronica Guerreri, Guido Lonsconi, Ludwig Schaub, even Verning on economic implication of COVID-19. And uh, Ivan, you have 60 minutes, and we have questions after that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, and it, it's a thrill to be here and present this paper, um, joint with uh, Veronica, Guido, and Ludwig, who are also present. And I should say at the outset, just a, a few words, you know, this is a, a huge crisis and I don't want to do any false advertising about what this paper is. There are so many papers now going around uh, tackling uh, questions of life and death and um, and sort of policy proposals. Um, this is a step back from that a little bit more. OK, dur it is motivated by policy discussions and things we we heard, but taking a step back and thinking about the problem um, from a from a more academic point of view and uh, thinking about what our models say or what they should say and, and changing them. Um, in particular, this is not an SIR model, which have become very popular and I think uh, very, very important work going on. There's so much important complementary work going on by great economists right now, uh, bringing in epi uh, type models. Uh, that That's one difference also with what we're doing today. We're going to really focus, I think, as we tried to say in the title, on the macroeconomic implications. We'll have a little bit to say on health policy at the end, but it's, it's sort of more a complement to the macroeconomics. Um, okay, so, but that said, of course, this is very inspired by, by the current uh, situation around the world. And, um, and our starting point is, you know, this discussion from a macro perspective um, about uh, the possibility of demand shortages. And I start here with uh, Say's law, which is really misquoted, uh, saying supply creates its own demand. And that's often, you know, Keynes tried to misquote uh, Say and, 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 and say he, he didn't think there could be demand deficiencies, which uh, economic historians tell me is incorrect. Um, 
And the proposition we want to explore today is a, a variant of this, but exactly that does have uh, demand shortages. So we want to ask whether a negative supply shock can create demand shortages. That's our question, okay? And we don't think this question has been addressed by anyone properly um, uh, to date. And we're going to try and give it a very clear uh, analytical um, analysis, all right? So that's, that's really our focus. And then, of course, this is inspired by the pandemic because we heard a lot of debates. You hear a lot of debates about uh, supply versus demand shocks. Um, and also, relatedly, whether we should respond with fiscal stimulus or monetary easing. Okay, so all these questions are connected. Indeed, our goal is to uh, provide a simple theory to deliver insights into when we might get demand deficiencies and what the policy implications are of that. Okay. So I'm going to summarize my our results here in this little uh, table. Um, and we're going to be working, building up the models. And in fact, there'll be more than what's on this table. But starting with a basic model, a representative agent model, which is the same as complete markets and, and a single sector, we're going to conclude that, of course, uh, supply shock cannot generate demand uh, in, uh, deficiencies. This is pretty standard, very well known. Basically, a demand shock. Uh, a supply shock will lead to a, a need to increase interest rates, not lower them. Less known, or to, to, I haven't seen anyone propose this, we're going to provide a new result which says, within complete markets, the same is true. Okay. Uh, in a one-sector model, within complete markets, you might think it can save uh, this conclusion, this prior conclusion, uh, but it can't, all right? The reason is, as you'll see, uh, demand is going to fall by more and the recession will be worse, but not enough, okay, to uh, go from having, you know, kind of a boom and needing interest rates to rise to having a recession from demand deficiency and needing interest rates in, in fiscal stimulus, all right? Then we'll show that uh, in, that it's really important to think about multi-sectors and thinking about the shocks being uh, very asymmetric. And in that case, we'll show that it is possible, even with a representative agent, to uh, get, um, this is a very simple result, but I think it, in, in, our, in, our, in our form, it's very powerful and insightful uh, that we can get um, demand deficiencies from negative supply shocks. And finally, we'll show, I think quite, this is probably the most interesting, is within complete markets, this condition becomes all the more plausible. So when you have multi-sectors and incomplete markets, so you have financial frictions, consumers that if they lose their income, really have to cut back on consumption, then it's, it's all the more likely that you'll get uh, demand deficiency. Okay. So um, I, I already spoke this, so let me jump to some other results we have, just previewing results. <clears throat> the, uh, another slightly surprising result is in this case of incomplete markets, Fiscal policy is typically very powerful, but we show that for per dollar spent, okay, that fiscal policy may be very ineffective, okay? And this is a new result. People have discussed one motive for that, which is low marginal propensities to consume. And that may be part of it, but we, our result is, is based on, uh, on a novel mechanism that I'll try and describe later. Okay. But um, interestingly, despite that, it may still be optimal to provide uh, fiscal stimulus. In, fa in fact, very well-targeted well social insurance is, is very important and comes out of the model as being optimal. So one thing is how effective something is per dollar spent, and another is what optimal policy is. I like to distinguish those two things. Sometimes those things are confused, um, and, and I think uh, the model tells us that, that they can go operate in opposite directions. Finally, going deeper, we explore beyond this uh, basic multi-sector incomplete market model and include um, worker mobility and supply chains. We'll have something to say about that. And perhaps most interesting are these other two um, extensions where we, we allow business failures. And, um, and the idea there is, you know, restaurants might have to close because of uh, the health risks, but then uh, that lowers demand, and that may lead other businesses kind of in a, in a, in a, um, is a, a sort of in a chain reaction to also close, all right? And, and relatedly, during the crisis, let's say you have a shutdown 
uh, there is the possibility of, of, of workers that have to stop working, remaining with the firm matched or in being labor, being hoarded, so to speak, or the possibility of destruction. We're going to analyze that. All right. We're going to provide a model for that. There's been a lot of very interesting discussion in the policy arena. I think very well thought out, actually, uh, discussion, but also a lot of different views. And as you'll see, we're, we're going to be capturing some of those views and formalizing them. All right. I think there are many interesting views out there. This slide is to clarify things about my language. I think it's very important. People talk about supply and demand uh, because it's so important, but also in a hurry and with different things in mind. And it's difficult sometimes. It's not always clear what they mean when they, in a macro context, they say aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Um, in particular, you know, obviously people have in mind the supply shock will reduce uh, demand. But that's not really the question we want to ask. We want to ask if there's demand deficiency. So if the demand uh, drop is greater than the supply drop. Um, a related confusion is whether when you think about a supply shock, how you have to model it. And here we will say we're perfectly fine. We're going to model it as a drop in the amount of labor that can go sell something. But it can equally be the customers that don't want to uh, buy this thing, a taste uh, modeled as a taste shock. because. We want to say all that matters is that you reduce the gains to trade. Okay, all that matters if you think of there's lower productivity in the economy. What does that mean? Well, there's lower benefit to me working and selling to you, and that has to do with the gains to trade. Okay, and that's what we mean by a supply shock in our case. We mean that lower in productivity, the lower in gains to trade. So, um, so but my precise definition is it will be in the context of my model. Here it's a little. Uh, out of context, but in the context of my model will be, I will say there's a demand deficiency if the interest rate that would uh, obtain in, in, with, uh, with full employment and flexible prices uh, needs to fall. And a corollary is that if you cannot lower interest rates that far, maybe because you hit the zero lower bound, that you will have a demand deficient recession. Okay. And I think that's a very precise definition in the context of the models we 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 often work with that i think is is useful uh to 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 focus on and again i think this question the question we adopt is very clear cut it's a qualitative very simple very simple question that we want to explore and has not been properly explored all right so let me start with the single sector uh complete market case okay so basically in this box i'm going to fill out this corner here for you all right um, and the model is very basic. So I'm going to have some preferences over consumption, all right? You can think of this utility function as being a uh, constant elasticity uh, of intertemporal substitution. And there's going to be a fixed endowment of labor. And you might want to think of that as there is a, this utility of labor, but it's very, very concave around the end bar, all right? So that you can allow me to think about uh, booms where there's overproduction in addition to underproduction. But we're going to work with uh, this n bar and, and targeting that n bar as the natural uh, rate of employment. And finally, technology is as simple as can be. Output is equal to uh, labor uh, utilized. And, um, and there's just one sector here. So this is just you know the, the description of the single, the production of the single non-durable good. OK? So that leaves us uh, with the next slide is already this, the whole model is here, all right? And in the background, and I won't, I don't think I have to tell this audience all the details of that. Uh, we won't do it today. Um, we will be thinking about a monetary economy with nominal rigidities, where maybe the interest rate is set by the monetary authority, um, and the rigidities can be in, in, in nominal wages or in prices or both, um, but. Uh, the, the key thing is, as usual in these models, it's useful to step back and think about the flexible price allocation first and what real interest rate is required. And then one can go back to thinking about those, the, those nominal rigidities, what they imply if you do not adjust the interest rate. And that's what, that's what we're going to keep doing. Okay. So let me jump to that. I'm going to consider an MIT shock. Um, I love that it's called an MIT shock. I don't know who baptized it that way. Um, if anyone in the audience knows, Maybe it was Kiyotaki, I've heard. Um, but now everyone uses it, okay? So maybe it's like, you know, maybe we shouldn't call it MIT shock. 
it's the the the, the, the useful assumption uh, in many cases. So <clears throat> to simplify the analysis, we'll have a MIT shock that we wake up. We were in a steady state at full employment. We wake up, and suddenly the labor supply drops by a proportion fee. So the new labor supply is one minus p times n. And we want to say, you know, this could be the shutdown, an actual government regulation, or it could be something more endogenous that we'll discuss later at the end. Okay, uh, but for now, we just take it as given that this is the, the the shock to labor supply, and this is a common trick. We assume that from period one on, uh, the 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 economy uh, goes back to normal in terms of fundamentals, and also we achieve the flexible price allocation, okay, through the proper conduct of monetary policy and so on. Okay, so we're all focused now on period zero and what happens in period zero given the shock, all right? And the, the key thing to, to think about there is what happens with the interest rate in a flexible price equilibrium. And you just use the Euler equation here and you get a standard result that the interest rate, uh, so I've substituted consumption for what it is, since there's less labor, consumption today is lower, and that implies you need a higher interest rate. Okay, and the converse, the the associated result is that if you do not adjust the interest rate and you keep it at one over beta, then um, then consumption is going to rise and you're going to get a boom. Okay, so interest rates should rise, the natural rate should rise, but otherwise you're going to get excess demand. We conclude. Okay, so let me move on and summarize that basic result. This is a uh, pretty textbook. So basically in a single sector, complete market economy, a negative supply shock increases the natural rate and leads to an excess demand if you don't change the interest rate. And the intuition I like to give is, well, this negative supply shock is the same as having good news about the future. And we all know, you know, if you have good news about the future, uh, the natural rate rises and we should think about, uh, and, and if you don't increase the interest rate, you're going to get a boom and, um, and that, that's the natural implication, okay? Because uh, basically ba agents want to borrow, not save, okay? So up next, we didn't get what we commonly set out for if uh, we're trying to explore whether we can get this negative supply shock to give us a demand deficient recession. We didn't get that, okay? If anything, there's gonna be a boom. A boom, of course, the level of output is dropping perhaps, but the point I'm making is that uh, the sector that is not shut down is overworked, okay? Relative to the natural allocation, all right? That's the definition here of, of, of being in a boom. Um, and so the next thing is to explore in complete markets. So let's go to that. Let's just take two here, okay? And we're gonna basically fill in this other uh, box of our uh, chart, all right? Okay, so... <clears throat> And complete markets intuitively should work, right? Because, you know, now people, they take a hit in their income. Maybe they, 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 they work in the sector that gets shut down. They might have a high marginal propensity to consume, and that's going to imply a bigger recession than we had before, okay? So kind of all bets are off that this won't do it, okay? But as I already anticipated, our result is it won't work. So let me show you the model. We're going to actually adopt a very simple uh, incomplete market model, but we have shown that it's that it fully generalizes. Okay, so we have a, a you know your use of resources on consumption or saving, and you get your labor income and you have your financial income. Okay, and a fraction mu of agents face a borrowing constraint. Okay, and um, and cannot cannot borrow. The other fraction can borrow. Okay, so. All right, and then the Euler equation for those that are either not getting the shock. So we're gonna imagine the shock, you know, some people get the shock, they can't go to work and, and, and a fraction fee of agents can't go to work. The other fraction can. Those that don't get the shock or those that uh, get the shock but are unconstrained by this, by, this, by this constraint because they're in the fraction one minus mu, all those agents satisfy an Euler equation with their consumption, okay? Consumption I, for those agents at time zero satisfies this Euler equation with their own consumption in the future. Now here's a little trick. This whole group of unaffected plus unconstrained, we can aggregate that group and think about their total consumption. And since an Euler equation holding for, for each one of these agents and assuming constant relative risk aversion, homothetic preferences in other words, we have the conditions for Gorman aggregation. 
And so basically, not surprisingly, you just get an Euler equation for the, for the total consumption of this group. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, so what is uh, the market clearing condition? The market clearing condition is that we said there's going to be full employment. That's our working assumption tomorrow on. Okay. And that'll come from this, this, this uh, favored group that either didn't get the shock or was not constrained, which is C1. And it will also come from those that were constrained and got the shock, which is a fraction mu phi in the population. And they, they are going to consume now their labor income, which they're going to bounce back and, and, and receive. So that's what this contribution is. And that should equal uh, uh, employment okay, and output. At time zero, though, um, we know it must be the equilibrium must have that um, if we're looking at the the natural equilibrium with full employment, we must have that the consumption of the group that's, that's this lucky group, unaffected and unconstrained, is the totality of output, okay? Because we're assuming the other agents are completely constrained and their income goes to zero, so they'll consume zero, okay? And thus, this is the consumption that we're gonna get at that time. All right, substituting this C0 and this C1 in this condition I mentioned earlier here, okay? we arrive at uh, this Euler equation that we can solve for R0. And I'm putting a star on it to denote it's the natural interest rate, okay? The interest rate at full employment. And what I find then is that the interest rate again goes up, okay? You see that it goes up, okay? Um, because um, consumption is again higher in, 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 in the future, okay? And importantly, you see the role of mu here. So as mu goes to one, the interest rate stays constant. It stays at one over beta. You know, the numerator here and the denominator here cancel as mu goes to one, okay? But otherwise we always get the interest rate rising. So that's the limit case. And otherwise we get the interest rate rising, okay? So <clears throat> summarizing when there is a, um, when there is a, a, a negative su supply shock and markets are incomplete, this is a mistake, this should be incomplete, okay? Um, then um, again, we find that the natural interest rate rises or stays constant in a limiting case and that uh, there will be excess demand if you do not raise that interest rate. Again, you might ask why, okay? And again, the same intuitions hold as before and now, though there is the fact that these guys that are constrained are dragging down the economy, but it's never enough because in the worst case scenario, they consume nothing, okay? And that's why this works in more general cases. We kind of looked at the worst case scenario where they go and consume nothing, okay? But otherwise, in general, they will consume something, but they will, um, but in the worst case scenario where they drag the economy the furthest down is that they consume nothing, right? But that's kind of neutral because if they stop consuming and they stop working, it's kind of like supply and demand moved by the same amount, all right? So I say here, basically, you know, you get, you get that you lose a producer, you lose a consumer, but it's a wash, okay? So in complete markets, this is the new result on incomplete markets is never gonna overturn your basic textbook uh, conclusion about uh, uh, supply shocks, okay? So now we turn to multiple sectors, okay? And you might note just quickly, I put here sectors that might stay open and here sectors that, that, are, that might close, okay? Um, my wife's a doctor, so she's, she's, she's here, uh, which has me a bit worried, but um, um, yeah. And uh, where's the chart? And exactly, we're filling this, this box here, okay? Right. So why would multiple sectors matter? There's a basic intuition that I really like, which is, uh, you know, basically it's going to allow that a shock uh, that hits everybody and is amounts to 50% of their income is different than a shock that hits a few, uh, half the population and is 100% of their income, okay? And um, I think I mentioned this later and I'll, I'll discuss that, but basically here's the model, basically an extension of what we had before. You have a utility over two goods. So just to anticipate good one is the one I'm gonna, uh, shut down, okay? And good two is the one that will remain open. 
And we're just going to work initially with a, with the CES uh, across these two goods in a constant elasticity of substitution over time. We have generalized this to more general utility functions. And in fact, interestingly, we find that it's, that it's, that it's kind of important for some things to extend it beyond this, all right? Um, you know, everyone knows the CS is great locally, but of course, if you take consumption all the way down to zero, uh, it really sort of constrains uh, the parameters you can choose. So we played around with with things that are close to a CES, but that near zero are different, and and that's kind of important for some things. I'll show you some things that relate to that. Finally, the production in each sector is one for one for labor. Okay, so this is the steady state again, except now you know what I basically now I've set fee here in the in the preference such that at the steady state, the share of the the share of labor that goes to one sector and the other is actually fee. Okay. So the share of labor that's that's working in the steady state in the sector one is fee. That means when we shut this guy down, okay, in a minute, um, then then um, we're gonna get um, a drop in employment of of proportion fee as as I did before in the one sector case, okay. And we've normalized things so that the relative price is one. And we're going to hit it with the MIT shock here, which is just again that we're going to shut down that sector. Okay. Again, at the end of the paper, we treat this as an endogenous thing, and we show cases where you want to do this, and we 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 all our results would go through if 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 you don't go all the way to this extreme. Okay. All right. So how are we going to solve this? Again, I'm going to look at the interest rate, the real interest rate, but now it's important to distinguish. This is the real interest rate for good two. Okay. Now you could do the real interest rate for good two, or you could do the real interest rate for good one, or you could do do a CPI aggregate real interest rate. Okay, um, and um, it's just convenient for our purposes because we're going to be shutting down good one to focus on the in real interest rate for good two, which is not going to get shut down. Okay, so indeed we're going to have an a, 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 an Euler equation for good two that reads like this. Okay. And see, it's the marginal utility of good two that matters for this Euler equation. Okay, but of course you have to evaluate, and that's important, under the consumption of both goods. Okay, that's going to be crucial. All right, all right. There's a couple of perspectives here, but one per, under one perspective that's crucial. And so then, um, how do we compute the natural rate after the shock? Well, I fed in the the MIT shock here. Okay, I set a zero, and under full employment, C two doesn't change. Okay, so this is what the natural rate has to be on um, under full employment after the MIT shock. Okay, so it turns out then that you can sh you can after you do the math, plugging in what these utility functions are and so on, you're going to get that the interest rate falls if this condition is met, and after you notice this condition is going to just solely depend on rho versus sigma. Okay, All right. So another so summing up what we get is. Now, with multiple sectors, a negative supply shock may lead to an, a, a, a lower natural rate being needed to achieve uh, full employment and a deficient excess demand uh, in recession if you do not lower that interest rate or if you do not provide fiscal stimulus that uh, if this condition is met. Okay? So this condition needs to compare the elasticity of intertemporal substitution with the uh, the elasticity across goods. So I'm illustrating here on this figure kind of the area where we get this result. And we call a shock that has this property of, of producing deficient um, uh, demand and producing less than full employment, a Keynesian supply shock, okay? It's kind of a placeholder because otherwise every time we write a sentence, we'd have to write, and the shock that produces blah, 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 and we came up with this name, uh, for, for lack of a better name, we're sticking to it for now, okay? So Keynesian supply shock is what we were looking for, and you can get it under these parameters. So it kind of splits the space into two, all right? All right, in a very simple way. Okay, good stuff. We did the multiple sectors with complete markets. Now let's do it with incomplete markets, okay? And so basically we found that the, in this row, we don't get the efficient demands from negative supply shocks. Here we found it's possible. Okay, um, and and now next, I'm going to study this this corner here, which is 
Now let's add incomplete markets, okay? Which is a very realistic assumption, especially because we're having a very asymmetric shock. So we do want to think about uh, those borrowing constrained uh, consumers and so on, all right? Okay. <clears throat> So here's how you do the math for this. It's very basic. So again, the natural interest rate uh, will be computed in this way. The main difference is now is what this consumption is and whose consumption is it. Now I have to look at the consumption of those agents that are unconstrained. Okay. And kind of like before, after doing the calculations, I'll find a condition that depends on parameters. Okay. So this is basic accounting of what those consumptions have to be given that they're in complete markets and that the agents that are constrained are, are going to be consuming zero times zero. So you go through that, you get these calculations, you plug it into here, and you end up with this result, okay? That the, the interest rate is, is a function of this, which implies that with multiple sectors and incomplete markets, I cannot believe my luck here missing these typos, okay? Um, but it makes it more dynamic to have to write on, on the iPad. Um, with a negative supply shock, now we find that you get uh, what we call the Keynesian supply shock, a lower natural rate or deficient excess demand if you don't lower the rate, um, if this condition is met. And this condition is weaker, strictly weaker than before, okay? Because you can see that it's a weighted average between one over rho, which we had before, and one now. Okay, and indeed, in the extreme cases, mu goes to one, the condition just becomes that uh, one over sigma be uh, greater than one. Okay, that that the intertemporal elasticity be greater than one. Okay, so let me show you on the figure. This is the figure we had before. Okay, and now when we go to incomplete markets, it looks like this, and I'm drawing the extreme case of mu going to one. Okay, just to to draw one case in, in a simple case. Oops. All right, so um, that's great. So um, I also want to note this shock is leading to output falling, and not only falling, but creating a, a, you know a, a recession relative to to the natural rate. Okay, so the, the output would have fallen just because of the supply shock if we achieve full employment. On top of that, we have less employment in the sector that was not shut down. Okay, so. This is interesting because in some models, in some situations, uh, you may get opposite results in a representative agent model where things are forward looking, you have inflation going on. There's a, a so-called paradox of toil, which is a, a, a negative productivity shock can actually be expansionary. And here it's not, it's totally the contrary. So we thought that was an interesting comparison. Here I'm showing what happens as a function of that market incompleteness, but also now, so if you take any one of these lines, that's what I did here. And I'm plotting it as a function of that market incompleteness. What happens with the output gap in uh, the non-shocked sector, okay? And, um, and I'm also plotting the different curves are for different sizes of the shock. So basically how big the sector that got shut down is. So, you know, 75% would be a, a, a extremely big sector shut down. Uh, then you have these other numbers here. And you see here what the output drop is, okay? When you have mu, uh, it, it's pretty high in these sectors depending on, on the size of that shock, okay? So it's just to illustrate that it doesn't just depend on these parameters, but also on the size of, of the shock, okay? So you, all right. So I think I call this bingo. We've completed the, the table here. Uh, that doesn't mean the, the talk is over, people. Uh, don't get excited. But um, I, I have some, some, some results I really, really want to show you next. But um, this is the, the one, one, one basic, some of our main results here in the table now are complete. And we understand especially that the combination of multiple sectors and incomplete markets is, is very important. Okay. Now, another new result that I think is interesting which is um, what if we do government spending? Maybe because, so we're gonna do government spending at a constant interest rate, maybe because we've hit the zero lower bound, okay? And I'm gonna do a very stylized, simple form of uh, fiscal policy. So I'll have government purchases of goods, but I'll also have taxes and transfers, okay? And idealized, I'm thinking of two kind of government, 
two policies. One where you increase G and you just tax the sector that didn't get hit. And the other where you actually transfer money to the person that got the, to the sector that got hit and tax the sector that didn't get hit to pay for it. Okay, so kind of a spending and a transfer policy. Okay, all right. Um, so if you think of what's happened in the US, most of the response has been on transfers, but there is a lot of talk about spending on infrastructure now, okay, in the coming, in the coming months. All right, so, so um, here's the basic result in this economy. We get that employment relative to full employment, okay, in the sector that didn't get hit, that's what N20 is. It's not N20, it's N2, zero. The employment in sector two at time zero relative to full employment there, okay, um, is equal to this formula. And you can basically ignore this constant term over here for now. We already talked about that, but now we're looking at the effect that policy has, all right? And the crucial thing is to note that government spending, okay, I say it here, has a multiplier of one, okay, so not greater than one, all right? And that the transfer multiplier is less than one. It's the average marginal propensity to consume, actually, okay, which in this economy is mu, all right? Um, and the reason for this is really there's no second round Keynesian cross effects, okay, operating here. So we've kind of disarticulated the way that government spending can feed back and produce a multiplier uh, above one, okay? All right, and that feedback, if you know, is you know the kind of circular income spending kind of idea. And here it's broken down, all right? And let's try and see why, but with this, the, with this figure, okay? So this figure represents what, what was happening before the shock, okay, all right? Um, there was a sector one that was producing, paying its workers, and the workers were consuming from the, their own sector, but also consuming from the other sector. There was a sector two that was producing and paying its workers, and those workers in turn also consumed both goods, okay? All was nice in this steady state, but then came the shock, and I'm gonna think about the case of complete markets first or a representative agent, then came the shock, and close down activity in this sector, okay? So we no longer have activity in the sector. We're not paying these workers, okay? So there's no consumption going to the sector. You see no arrows pointing at it. And these workers are still getting paid and they're still consuming, but of course they can't consume sector one anymore. That's that arrow disappeared. The magical thing is these workers are still consuming from sector two, thanks to the complete market assumption, okay? So basically in the background, and I didn't draw it, you could think that there's a transfer here or someone's making some transfer to keep uh, these, these agents consuming, all right? All right, so that's what's going on with complete markets or representative agents, which are the same thing, okay? And in that case, I'm drawing the, the very benchmark case where sigma equals rho, in which case these effects are such that this sector's output is unchanged. It's like the additive utility case. And in that case, you know, the economy contracts in labor and it contracts in consumption, in total consumption, but the consumption and the output of this sector remains unchanged, okay? Which is a simple benchmark, not particularly, I would say, realistic, but, but, but it's a particular benchmark that's easy to draw. So these arrows look the same as these arrows I had before, that's the point, okay? All right, so now what happens if instead I have incomplete markets? Uh-oh. All right, sector one workers here, I'm getting worried they're not gonna be able to consume, all right? And in our extreme incomplete market, of course, you could get that the arrow gets smaller instead of disappearing, we've done it so that the arrow disappears, all right? So now if the arrow disappears, um, this sector is already shut down, we said that, but now this sector is still producing, but less than before because it can only rely on its own workers for consumption, okay? And, in general, these, the, the own workers, even if income hadn't changed, will not want to consume the, wh whatever these guys stop consuming. So total output will be lower. That means actually income will be lower, which further reduces uh, the, the, the consumption and output here. Okay. So I think this is a very intuitive, and this is, so I ex ex tried to explain what happened. And this is also what's behind, I was trying to explain the fiscal multiplier result. 
This is also what's behind the fact that we get uh, that there's no second round effects, okay? <clears throat> because now if, if you're in the incomplete market case and, and you provide any uh, government spending, okay, that where are the high MPC people? They're in this sector, okay? These guys are the ones that were hit, okay? And they're up against their borrowing constraint, all of them. But uh, it, when you spend you and you buy goods, you only buy these goods when the government spends on G, you only buy these goods. So you only expand the income these guys get through the feedback effects. So all those feedback effects of, well, if I buy more, you get more income are only going to the people with the low MPC, marginal propensity to consume, okay? So, the, the, so basically you get the round one, but you don't get the round two in the sense of you don't get it through the, the high MPC agents, all right? Um, and so that's why the multiplier is so low. And something similar is happening with transfers. I provide transfers to these agents. Okay, great. Now I create a, a small arrow here. I'll make it smaller than the one over there. That's good. That's mu times the transfer I gave them. Okay. But I don't get any feedback because when now these guys spend more, uh, it doesn't come back to them and they, they're the ones with a higher MPC. Okay. So I think this graph illustrates both what happens and also why we find uh, this novel result about the, the, the multipliers, okay, being, so basically we find that policy is, it has more moderate effects, even though we might have a very high marginal propensity to consume. So people have noted, I, I really love reading on Twitter, a lot of insightful ideas, and people had noticed that maybe fiscal policy will be less effective per dollar in this crisis because people don't want to go spend because you know they cannot they cannot spend on restaurants and and maybe not even on durable goods since you going to buy them might be dangerous etc so um so that's fine that's part of it maybe um we can introduce that channel here i think we actually uh have part of this channel but the novel channel i'm talking about is something else it's that that i haven't seen discussed which is that actually this feedback uh, will will get interrupted that's behind the Keynesian multiplier. All right. So it's a very stark and, and striking result, uh, we think. Uh, we learned we learned something from this. Okay, I hope you did too. So now I'm gonna go and talk about um, mobility and I'm gonna skip uh, talking about supply chains, which we also sometimes call demand chains uh, because it works through demand. But um, I'll talk about mobility because it's very simple and I think there's, there's some insight here. So, because it's obviously extreme to imagine that the workers that were shut down um, cannot work in the other sector. There might be a bunch of people who lost their job at Starbucks that now can work for Instacart, for example. Okay, so, um, so, so here's that, we're gonna choose a parameter and imagine that alpha of the workers can switch sectors and the other ones can't. This is a very simple model, okay? We like simple model to get uh, clear insight, okay? So simple model is alpha fraction cannot, uh, can switch sectors. So before I had alpha zero, okay? And now I'm plotting for you here where, where full employment is, that's this line here, which is constant, okay? And previously I, I was looking at this point here, okay, with alpha equal to zero. And now obviously, and that would be the efficient employment level after the shock because we cannot work in the shutdown sector. So the full employment now, if workers cannot move sectors is one minus phi times n bar as we've been working with, okay? Now we're gonna allow some of those workers to shift sectors. And so the full, what we call full efficient employment depends on the value of alpha as we move along this line, okay? Right. So as alpha rises, more workers are able to shift to the other sector. In the extreme case where alpha were one, of course, we should go back to full, fully employing everyone, just everyone working for the sectors that, are, that remained open, all right? Okay, obviously that's an extreme going all the way to alpha one. But, um, but the point is you have these two things. And now what happens is that at the complete market equilibrium, the equilibrium with full insurance, the amount of employment does not depend on alpha. The reason is when you work through it, it's, it's, it's determined by demand for consumption and alpha doesn't figure in there, all right? And so when you solve it, you know, we've anchored period one 
and then we're looking at the Euler for between zero and one, and that's where we get consumption. None of that stuff depends on alpha. So when you look at the amount of employment, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the equilibrium employment with complete markets, okay, then uh, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a horizontal line, okay? Of course, complete markets is not very realistic. I'll get to incomplete markets in a second. But the main point is that means we now have to look at the excess demand, how far we are from full employment is this gap here. Previously, we were studying this gap, the smaller gap. Now the gap could be larger. So basically, it could be larger because even though there's so many people willing to switch, demand's not there. Okay. All right. So we think this is kind of interesting case to think about. Um, but things get even more interested when we introduce incomplete markets. So if, it, if you have incomplete markets, it's no longer true that the equilibrium doesn't depend on alpha because the amount of spending also depends on people who can make a living and that's going to depend in equilibrium on alpha. So it's not purely determined from just the, this forward-looking Euler equation. There's also sort of consumption that depends on current income. And so we will live on this line depending on the value of alpha, okay? So previously we were looking at this point, okay? And now we might be somewhere here, for example. And again, there's still gonna be excess employment losses. So we still have the result that we can get the result that we had before of deficient demand recessions in the sense that there is an employment loss, okay? Relative to what we should have given that people can move, okay? And um, however, you know, the alpha does help potentially with the level of output here, okay? Both, um, both the green line and the blue line are higher than if we, uh, we had alpha zero. Okay. However, what might be more interesting is to think how big this gap is. Okay. Is the gap getting bigger or smaller with alpha? Okay. And this here, it's kind of a race, the slope of this curve versus this curve. And we've worked it out and it's an inequality that depends on parameters. I'm not going to go through that, but basically, oops, I thought I had something that said it, but okay. Um, basically it does depend on, on those parameters. Okay. So, so basically what, what's happening with this is a function of alpha depends. Um, oh, I have it down here. The problem is I can't see it when I'm, <laughs> does it rise or fall with alpha? This excess employment losses that that's ambiguous. Okay. All right. So now I want to go to one of the features of the model we're, we're most proud of actually capturing. It's, it's, it's very uh, neat and, and, and somewhat more outside our basic new Keynesian model that we're also used to, okay? So kind of a more uh, uh, novel angle to the modeling part, not just the analysis. Okay, so here's the model. We're gonna have two sectors. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, we're gonna move from two sectors to a continuum of varieties, okay? And the key thing here, and that's, that's standard, that's, I'm not claiming anything interesting there. The key thing here is this, we're gonna allow these, uh, these monopoli mon monopolists that produce these varieties, okay, to consider shutting down because they're going to have to pay each one of them a fixed cost. This could be like a, some sunk labor you need just to open your shop and you need to pay to the workers, okay? So before you produce anything, you, you just have to put the, you have to turn the lights on, you're spending uh, this, this V or new, I'm not sure what it is, okay? And just to get things to be smoother, imagine that that fixed cost is higher for some firms than for other firms, okay? And order them, and we're gonna have a, a, a distribution of those uh, fixed costs, okay? So we have a continuum of these uh, firms initially, and they're all paying this fixed cost. We're gonna set the model up so that if we're at the steady state, they all wanna remain open, okay? So we're gonna make these fixed costs not too big, that given the markup they have, they do wanna remain open. Okay, but we're gonna now shock the economy with MIT shock under the conditions that we described earlier that intuitively is going to produce a, a, a demand deficient uh, recession. And that means output is gonna fall. So you have a profit margin, but now your output is falling. Okay, so the, the firm is maybe not gonna want to, uh, not gonna meet its fixed costs with, those, with that fixed profit margin in a lower, uh, scale, all right? So that's gonna drive some firms, the ones with the highest fixed cost to drop out. But once they drop out, that's as if endogenously they shut down. So we're getting more shutdown 
than what the government regulated, let's say. Okay. Um, so we had some, some sectors that had to shut down and now we're getting a spillover to these other ones. All right. So let me show you how that works. So fee is the amount we're exogenously shutting down. Okay. And then we're going to have a, a mass fee hat that actually shut down and that that's endogenous. And there's really two equilibrium conditions here. Okay. Um, and basically this is the condition I worked out earlier that after you know how many firms shut down, this model looks exactly like the two sector model where all I have done is determine the fraction fee of, uh, of the economy that gets shut down. So basically one, let me repeat that. Once I solve for fee, this model, we did this on purpose, looks exactly like the model I had before as if I had calibrated the two sector model to have that value of fee. Okay, so once I know what the endogenous fee is, the, the rest of the economy, the, the aggregates look as if I had set that fee exogenously to that value in the previous analysis. Okay, so the interesting thing now, so this is this condition. If you go back, you'll see it again, it's just there. Okay, and then there's a new condition, which is whether uh, firms have um, want to pay their fixed cost. And that's determined by this condition here, right? Because the higher is the end, the more the employment there is, that means there's more, more production and that means firms are selling more. And so they will be able with their profit margin to want to meet the fixed cost, okay? And so that's why um, the fee here depends on the value of employment, okay? All right, so we get these sort of, so to speak, two equations and two unknowns that are determining the equilibrium, okay? Before I had this equation, but I was fixing fee, and getting in, now I'm also thinking about this feedback to making fee hat further endogenous, okay? So this is what I was saying in the intro, like, you know, we shocked uh, restaurants, we told them they had to shut down or they, our consumers wouldn't have shown up anyway, as you'll see, you know, we have a discussion of that towards the end, but basically uh, for macro purposes, imagine they're shut down, okay? But what happens with those clothes stores, those clothing stores? Some of them also shut down. Maybe there's some marginal ones that could have remained open. They now just have less, less, uh, because the economy is in a, in a, in, under our conditions, the economy would be in a, in a depressed state. People don't have enough income. There's incomplete markets, remember, et cetera, et cetera. So there is less people buying stuff from those stores. Okay. Um, even if those stores are providing the same goods in a, in a, in a safe way. Okay, there might be less demand for them, and this is making them shut down. And then that means it's effectively as having a bigger shutdown, which is then creating further effects. All right, so let me show you this on a graph, uh, which we're very proud of, which it looks like this. Basically, here's the fraction that remains open, one minus fee. And I'm plotting these two, these two conditions I had. This was the demand locus, the one I had in the previous model, and this is the new one which is the dotted line, okay? And I've plotted things so that here, the equilibrium is up here, okay? The, the stable equilibrium you wanna care about is up here so that at a steady state, we all the firms remain open, okay? And now what happens if we shock the economy and we effectively say, no, this fraction of firms has to exit, okay? Okay, we're gonna do it that way, all right? Then what happens is you get this, right? Um, we did do this. So you, I don't know if you see the dotted line here. That's the fraction we exogenously hit, but that moves the whole curve now. And the curve now finds an intersection at an even lower point. Okay. So to sum up, what we get is um, a, a sort of multiplier of sorts, a business cascade effect uh, that, that depresses the economy still further. So once, let me say this again, once you have the necessary conditions to have a demand deficient equilibrium, you can get this knock on effect of making it even worse, which is I think capturing to some extent what people are, are worried about when in the case of uh, business failures from lower revenue. We're exactly capturing that the firms that, that can still remain in operation also have, have lower revenue, okay? All right, great. We have an example here in closed form, but I'm gonna skip that. It's a very nice example, check it out. Um, and then we talk about policy here and we show that if you uh, subsidize uh, uh, the payroll, so maybe you lower the payroll tax or you even provide a subsidy, 
then you can mitigate this effect and encounter it, okay? Um, and we have this nice formula in this, in this special case, okay? And in fact, you can get similar results in some cases with monetary policy, just from the fact that lower interest rates um, may also affect this exit decision, okay? Okay, I'm not gonna talk much about that. I do wanna talk with my, I'm, I'm measuring my time. I think I have eight minutes remaining. Um, I'm, I do wanna talk about labor hoarding um, and the counterpart of that, which is job worker match destruction, okay? So basically what I spoke just now is about the sector that didn't get really hit, that was spared, but then they also had some exits, uh, worryingly because demand was deficient. Now what happens, an, a big concern is also for those sectors that got hit, since the shock is temporary, will they remain in business and will those job, uh, job employer matches remain intact, okay? And so we're gonna model that. That's called, uh, that the question is whether firms keep their workers labor uh, and hoard that labor, okay? So there's not enough work, I think, in macro on labor hoarding. There's some interesting papers, uh, but, but few of them. Um, we're gonna write a very simple model of this uh, and I'm gonna only sketch it here. Basically, <clears throat> here is the problem of a firm in the sector that actually got hit with a shutdown. They have zero sales today. And if they want to remain in touch with this worker, we're going to assume for contractual reasons or whatnot, that they need to pay the wage. They still need to pay the wage. Okay. And then that's of cost, but the benefit is they keep the worker and they have some surplus tomorrow, which it, I'm calling B1. So this might be the markup they get between this worker and the stuff they sell. Okay. Right. And obviously they're going to compare that to the option of just exiting. All right. Okay. And so we're modeling this now for now without unemployment benefits. The idea is then we can, on top of that layer, the discussion of unemployment benefits, but I'm not gonna get to that now. Okay, so, so this is just um, th this very simple model of labor hoarding. So basically if this is negative, firms are gonna fire th their workers or workers and firms are gonna agree that we should just uh, destroy these matches. If instead this is positive, then there'll be labor hoarding and as a result, this is the key thing. We set up the model so if there is labor hoarding, so if all firms want to keep their workers, now there's no difference between being a worker in sector one and sector two, okay? So the economy by itself achieves full insurance, even though there's no insurance, okay, mechanism, because there's no job losses, all right? So there is an output loss, all right? But it's shared in the economy. And in the background, what I'm not describing for you is the ownership of these firms, which is what's achieving this efficient uh, spreading of, of this cost. But the main thing is there isn't this big set of workers that got shut down and are taking the hit, okay? Because if there's complete labor hoarding of these, empl these employees, then they will keep uh, uh, an income, all right? And that means that it's, it's going to be completely identical to having perfect insurance. So here's what can happen, all right? Now, oh, I should have said this. Okay, so this is great. Okay, so then if you look at this condition with equality, that's an interest rate that just barely makes me want to keep the match. So the lower is the interest rate if V1 is positive, which we assume, the, the more chance this condition will be met. And for a low enough interest rate, it will be met. Okay, of course, you might hit the ZLB bound first. All right, but so here I want to discuss monetary policy very briefly. All right. Um, this also obviously has implications for fiscal and unemployment benefit policy, but, um, but let me just briefly talk about monetary policy. There's something interesting here, which is if you lower the interest rate enough, now you can think that you lower the interest rate enough so that this condition holds, maybe just marginally holds. Then you've saved the economy in the sense that now there's this perfect uh, risk sharing. And as a result, uh, you don't get the kind of uh, extra effects that come from incomplete markets. So there's two options there. Either you were in a situation of whether you would have had demand deficiency anyway with a representative agent, or you're in a situation where you only got it because you know, you got close maybe with a representative agent parameters, but not quite. You still would have had a boom um, in, in the sector that didn't get hit. But then because of incomplete markets, you went over the, the line and you have a, a demand deficient uh, equilibrium. So there's those two cases. So basically, we were initially at the steady state here with the interest rate, and now we're always considering lowering it because we got this Keynesian supply shock, as we call it, this demand deficient induced 
uh, uh, shock to demand from, from the labor supply shock. And you may have to be in this situation where you could lower it to get full employment in that sector. But if you make an extra effort in monetary easing, you can make this condition be met, okay? This condition met and achieve that labor hoarding and, and perfect insurance and the economy will do even better. Okay, so you may want to make go that extra mile, basically. Okay, then there's another case here where this flips, but I, I'm not going to talk about it for interest of time. All right, I, according to my watch, I have three minutes left. Um, I just want to go over one last thing, then. All right, in the last section of the paper, we discussed optimal health and uh, macro policy. Okay, um, in a very stylized way. Okay, this is where you know a lot of these great efforts people are making with. SIR models, um, you know, make contact more with what we're doing here at the end. All right, uh, but we just wanted to add this to give some kind of. You'll see we have, I think, one novel thing to say, um, but of course we're not going to do anything quantitative or anything like it uh, here. All right, but if you like the closest kind of, you know, we're making contact with the kind of things that you know, let's say Eichenbaum, Rebello, Trabant uh, have modeled. So we have again the two sector model, but now we're going to add that we care about our health. Okay, this could capture health or survival, et cetera. We're going to make it additive just to simplify. And health depends on things that you can control. So you can control how much you consume, you can control how much you work, right? So those are internalized, that's not an externality. But then there also might just be an externality, all right? Just if there's more activity, there's more people on the streets, even when I consume very little, I go out and I get, get, get infected. All right. Um, so this is a, the health externality, okay? But there's also these other forms of, of, of inefficiency in this economy that are still there, which is the lack of insurance we talked about, okay? And the fact that we, so even if you had full employment, if you have a lack of perfect insurance, you, you have an inefficient economy. And on top of that, we may have lack of full employment, okay? So these are kind of the three things to keep in mind when we're thinking, okay, in this model, how are we doing relative to an idealized super first best? Okay. All right. So I'm going to do this more as a discussion, basically. Um, it's a series of examples, really, where we try and bring this, these ideas out. And this is my last slide before I conclude. Um, so basically, imagine you start with no health policy. Then interestingly in this model, and people have pointed this out, some people make a big deal out of this, private decisions will limit consumption in sector one. So we will get less consumption and hence less output in sector one. Also people, some people don't wanna to go to work in sector one. So labor supply also contracts in sector one. It's not clear which contracts more, okay? Is it more dangerous to be a customer or more dangerous to be an employee? And how do those two people feel about it? Okay, but so, depending on parameters, you can get involuntary uh, unemployment in the sense that more people, some maybe fewer people want to work there, but a lot fewer people want to consume and you can get involuntary unemployment. So even without any policy from the point of view of the government, you get this kind of, um, of involuntary unemployment already. Okay. Now, the first remark is that this unemployment may not be socially inefficient. It's not like, oh, we should be sad about this. And this is a lot of commentators make this point, you know, because the optimal policy will take into account that we may want to reduce employment and consumption even further. Why? Because the planner will take into account this aggregate externality. Okay, and because of that, it, there's kind of a fight because, between the Keynesian wedge, which would want to reduce this involuntary employment, and the Pigouvian externality that private agents don't internalize. They internalize somewhat getting their self sick, but they internalize everything. And because of that, then you, you may suffer from involuntary employment, but the planner sort of in a second best sense might prefer to have even less employment there. And if it has to have that by having involuntary employment, it would be happy to have maybe even more involuntary employment. Okay, so that's insight one. Second insight is there's a complementarity, okay? In the following sense, it, under some parameters, and we discussed this, it, it may be optimal for the government to put like a Peruvian tax on sector one that's so high that you effectively shut it down. Okay, so now you've shut sector one down as we used to be assuming, now we're getting it as a result. But now obviously this can cause, based on our previous analysis, a Keynesian supply um, shock. So a, a, a excess demand deficiency. So now we need to lower the interest rate. 
So there's kind of like this complementary. Once you do the health policy, now you got to do the macro policy. And if you don't do it, you're going to be in, in, in suffering a worse situation. So finally, remark three is a statement that these complementaries are so strong, they work three ways. And um, with incomplete markets, if you can target those transfers very well, well you, can you can hit three birds with one stone. Okay, what we mean by that is, suppose you provide full insurance, so we write down a model where we show you, if you provide full insurance, to these workers, that's going to raise the natural rate, because you're going to go from the complete markets to the representative agent, okay, and it might make the ZLB, for instance, not even binding anymore, okay, you may not even have to lower R, you may now have to raise R, okay, so all these complementaries are working. In fact, now that you're not suffering from all these involuntary and employment things, now you may be more bold about your health policy. You're not so worried that that's going to affect the economy. Okay, so there's this kind of mutual complementarity between taking these actions that we think is very interesting because different people talk about one action or the other. Maybe this is the main, but this is an, an interesting idea. I think that I haven't seen discussed how 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 complementary they are. In our case, it's a bit extreme. You get to the first best, but the point is to make that that clear. Okay, indeed, in our case, we we get to the first best, um, but more generally there's th this three-way complementary. Okay, I'm done. We went, this is my conclusion. We filled out this chart, but we also talked about a number of other results. And I just wanna say thank you uh, for paying attention and I value any feedback and questions you might have. Just before that, let me say, uh, we'll be posting the paper as, 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 as soon as we can. Um, I'll be putting out a link uh, for that uh, as soon as it's ready, maybe later today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Ivan. Uh, very interesting. And um, we're going to take uh, questions now. Uh, if you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, but I'm going to start off with uh, Kosmin Ilut. So I should put you on now, Kosmin. Wait one second. Hello. Hi, Kosmin. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, so my question is if we take a standard flexible price RBC model and we see that after a negative TFP shock, real rates go down, is this a counterexample to your statement? Say that again, sorry. <clears throat> so if oh, the, if okay, yeah, like if I have capital and I'm in a real model, yes. I agree, but that's not likely for a temporary shock, right? Because the marginal product of capital that matters is like the future one. So absolutely, we thought about that. That's very relevant if you if you have a huge permanent shock to either productivity or you had a, a, a huge drop in, in labor supply, which I'm hoping we don't have. OK, so this is like if you think of the, the big plagues in history, that might be relevant. OK, uh, mm -hmm. and there's an interesting paper that discusses that uh, Jordan co-authors and, and, and we cite it. Um, but I think that's not so relevant for modern times where we, what we're going to do is basically take the right steps to avoid that, okay? And even though we might have a mortality that's way higher than we want to have, um, I don't think anyone's talking about how it's going to really, you know, uh, that mortality is going to uh, affect the, the labor force in a major way, in a ma in major permanent way. It's more about the shutdown policy. So that's our focus at least, okay? You know, in particular with with, uh, with the coronavirus, it's, you know, older people, maybe outside of the labor force already that are getting uh, hit the worst. Okay, so we think all, for all these reasons, it makes sense to focus on something very temporary and that wouldn't happen. I'll, I'll take advantage of your question to say, another thing we abstracted from is uncertainty. And that's not because we think it's irrelevant. Uh, it's just that it's well understood it's a clear mechanism. It's potentially relevant in this case um, and complementary to the kind of forces we really want to isolate. Okay, that's the first thing. But not to, so to say it is possibly relevant, but there are things that make it less relevant, I think, for us um, in the case of the pandemic and lockdown. It's that, you know, those pandemic and lockdowns are very front loaded, basically. Okay, so. You're not getting a shock where now with the financial crisis and I don't know what, how that's going to affect others, you know, and so on. From the lockdown itself, okay, um, the, it, it's relatively front loaded, okay? Now, it may last a long time or it may be um, 
uncertain even how long it lasts. But I don't think those things are going to get you going in the way you need uncertainty shocks uh, to get you going. What you really need is the uncertainty is such that things might be even worse tomorrow. Okay. Um, and that may even be too. And so the last point here, this last point is, um, so even if you might get a dip in the future, so we're not at the worst point now, that still means you want to study. So what, what I would say is like, suppose this is going to happen. Okay. Uh, it's still okay. So then, then we're looking at what happens from here on out and people worry about this recovery period. Okay. And then uncertainty is not going to help you with that, with that part. Okay. So we want to, we want to focus on that. And finally, there's also like uncertainty might go the other way. Like people are just going crazy over toilet paper. So uh, can increase demand. So sorry, I took advantage of that, but I wanted to make clear the things we don't include. And in, in, in we did have some thought into why we didn't include it, apart from the obvious benefit of focusing our analysis. Okay, I'm going to give the next question to Rick van der Bluck. Rick, are you there? Seems to have gone. So, uh, um, Christina Ayano. Rick, Rick, you need to. I'll, I'll go to Christina and then uh, we'll see if we get the Rick on afterwards. Christina Ayano, are you there? Yes. Okay. Thank Hi, you. Christina. Hey. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very uh, interesting and uh, clarifies a bunch of things. I had a question uh, regarding the part of the sort of the, the policy response that we've seen in the United States where uh, uh, there's this uh, subsidization to firms conditional on them keeping their workers. I yeah. think it's about like uh, 500 billion of the bill was uh, sort of on that on that uh, point. And for, I think that, uh, you know, you're, you, you have uh, two, maybe a trade off that you're presenting with your paper. So I just you know, wanted to ask on that. On the one hand, it seems that based on the mobility results that you had, uh, these policies uh, might be uh, delivering exactly the opposite of what we might want because it's sort of keeping the workers attached to the work, to the firms that are not producing. And you might, you know, want precisely those workers to move to the work, to the, to the firms that are uh, producing or, you know, subsidize that type of movement. But on the other hand, you had later your uh, labor hoarding result, which suggested that these type of policies that allow firms to hoard their, uh, you know, to keep, to, to keep paying their workers might be a good thing. So um, I'm sorry. So I just wanted to ask on your thoughts on that question, uh, you know, given these, these sort of trade off that you have in your paper. I love that question because it, it's really thoughtful and we had not thought about that. Uh, it's a good point. Basically, we have those two elements, but you're saying, what if you mix them up? Um, right. And the truth is, uh, we hadn't we hadn't done that. I'm going to just venture a question answer. Obviously, you end up in an interesting trade off now. Um, I really believe in the value of these matches. There's a huge policy discussion about whether unemployment benefits provided for workers that are laid off is enough to keep their incomes high and still they'll be in touch with firms and kind of go back. But I think there's a, a understandable concern that that might not be enough. I, I am concerned. Uh, so I think a better, you know, that might be the best solution given the institutional arrangements we have and the need for, for doing things quickly. But I was concerned about, uh, and I do think there's a benefit to achieving greater labor hoarding. Um, but we didn't do this mix and it's an interesting balancing act. Now, if I could venture, yeah. if the shock is temporary, I agree you get this mobility, but I'm not sure you want it, right? Like, um, this is very speculative, but yeah. you know, it, it could be a really bad thing to induce this mobility if we're going to potentially go back to normal in mm -hmm. some months. And mm -hmm. so I would say just guessing, but I have my own bias that this match stuff is important, that that's going to weigh heavily towards the, the keep, keeping the match, preserving the matches. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. So um, I'm going to turn to Pierre Olivier Gorinchas for the next question. Hi, Pierre Olivier. We can't hear you, Pierre Olivier. Well, maybe you're talking, but we don't, we missed yeah. it. Hit unmute. You should, you should be unmuted.
or you can type your question and we read it. I okay. still don't hear it. Um, no, okay, let's see if we can come back uh, to Pierre Louis then. Uh, Great. Um, um, so, see, so we have. Um, uh, we have a ah, Lulik. Can try. Okay. Um, yeah. No. Fascinating. Fascinating. Pretty fascinating analysis, and it speaks to key issues being discussed right now. One thing that I'm wondering about the fiscal policy. Uh, you know, one way of thinking about fiscal policy is, you know, there's a more, you know, there's a production market that shuts down. And in some ways, you know, we could just keep on operating the economy by just pretending it's still being produced. That is, um, you know, imagine you would normally, you know, get on a flight or, or, or do something. You know, you still pay for it, right? And therefore the workers are still being paid, except you don't get the goods. And, uh, you know, that, that would, uh, that, you know, in, in terms of redistribution terms and in terms of these borrowing constraints and so forth, that would have no long effect. Of course, uh, you know, the, the stuff doesn't get produced. I mean, that's a, that's a given. We can't get around this. But I wonder whether this, this line of thinking that, uh, that fiscal policy amounts to donating effectively or to purchasing goods, even though the goods aren't delivered, whether that's, uh, whether that's sort of a good way of thinking about what's happening in terms of fiscal policy or whether there's a key difference. Thank you for your question. I think you're describing almost exactly the, the Seitz and Zuckman proposal. Uh, they called it the buyer or payer of last resort. And I think it's uh, actually a very interesting, uh, solid idea on principles. I mean, like, you know, Rob Townsend would approve. <laughs> you know, you want perfect insurance. This is a huge shock, very observable. No moral hazard exempt about who got the shock. And, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's pull out our notebooks and look at that perfect insurance condition again. Um, and, and so it makes a lot of sense conceptually. And I agree with you, it would solve all these uh, borrowing constraint problems um, in, a, in a very direct way. The, of course, the problem with that has been, I think, um, it's very ambitious. And so people worry that it would be taken advantage of or that it would just cost a lot fiscally or that it would take a lot of time to roll out, okay, uh, just uh, logistically. So maybe we should think about this. I do think it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea to think about for the next pandemic. We really should be prepared for the next pandemics more and think all these things through. What happened in this crisis, clearly each country responded with institutions they had, that they had used in the past. And that makes a lot of sense because you need to roll it out quickly. Um, so in the case of the US, it's unemployment benefits, which has been used before in the Great Recession and, and checks mailed to people. Those are things that the government knew how to do relatively quickly. Uh, it might not be ideal, uh, but I, I think it's an interesting idea. Time will tell whether it was super important to get to that amount of conceptual uh, risk, risk sharing or these other ideas were enough, but um, I think it's an interesting but, idea. But if I can just briefly follow up, um, how different is your fiscal policy from that idea? Is there, something, is there something that you do that's better or are you constraining yourself that's worse? Or is there, is no, there something... I, you know, just, yeah. just in comparison, I'm just in order to understand what your fine yeah. analysis. In our analysis, that would achieve the first, the, the first best insurance. And it would be similar to what I said earlier, that once you have that, then you don't have the force that incomplete markets brought. So potentially you, you may still have a recession for just the things you would get in a representative agent economy. Uh, if you hit the zero lower bound and you needed to lower interest rates further, but it might be a lot milder or the interest rate might not need to go that far or even go up. So it depends on parameters, but uh, basically that would be valuable all around. So this is very important. Like I think, in fact, I think a conciliatory way to think about some people who have said, oh, we shouldn't be stimulating what, but they do say provide the social insurance. And what kind of our results are really that that is the best form of stimulus. And so maybe they're just speaking kind of different words or, or putting different emphasis. Um, so 
I guess uh, that would be my 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 answer. So in our model, Harold, we do that that kind of policy would be great. But I mentioned all the practical pro hurdles that I think faced. Perfect. So um, I I have um, the question from Pierre Olivier, and I, I'm going to ask it. So he he was uh, essentially going to ask about uh, how this work out um, internationally. So there are lots of um, business uh, relationships between countries these days. And um, and I guess in your setup, uh, you would have a um, lot of spillovers uh, between countries. Now, suppose that uh, this happened in one country and affects uh, the demand for another country's output, maybe, and then maybe through uh, supply chains and so on. It seems likely here that the foreign policymakers, they may not internalize their response to this uh, um, optimally. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. This is uh, like, you know, if you think of the country as a whole and it's suffering this, we need a, a coordinated response. But if we yeah. get an uncoordinated response, it'll be suboptimal in general, unless you are lucky and everything is super symmetric and cancels out. A similar thing happens even in the US if a lot, if we're going to rely a lot on state policy and local municipalities. Uh, that there might not be enough coordination there. Um, I mean, even forgetting the demand, excess demand issues, you know, there's externalities between towns. If you don't solve your coronavirus, then eventually I'm going to get it again, even if I solve mine. Uh, so there's reasons for, for all these kind of coordinations. I agree, it's very difficult. I know you know a lot more about that than me because I saw uh, you've written about it in, in, in given talks. Um, I just would underscore, yes, I think it's, it's hugely important. Um, another aspect of that is that some countries, maybe I care a lot about this because I'm from Latin America, I'm from Argentina, is a lot of countries, not just coordination, but some countries need help. You know, they don't have the resources to face this. And maybe in a similar fashion to how we think about risk in insurance across uh, people within a country, we should be thinking about that. Uh, across the world okay and again and 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 it boomerangs back to and if we don't solve it in argentina it might be bad uh for other countries in the future as well um so there's there's that huge issue that worries me a lot i mean if things have been bad in the u.s just imagine latin america with the little fiscal room it has with the hospitals and the so so it's a it, it it's it's another dimension of what you're discussing Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, so we have a few other ones here. Actually, uh, let me ask one myself. Um, I was wondering about the, in the, ba the basic example you have. Um, um, so suppose a, suppose the fraction that's not hit by the shock, however, wonder about that they could be hit by the shock. Yeah. Would that uh, could that possibly uh, imply that e even in the one sector incomplete market small now you, you do you do get the demand the, the vision recession. absolutely yes yes that's what i meant about the dip if we're getting the shock but we're worried about the dip still happening yeah. uh in in the amount of activities that are hit then um then then you can get those kind of effects okay. um and i think that's that's definitely there we're we're, we're abstracting from that but i think in the us that happened let's say in february <laughs> But like now we're pretty locked down. We're gonna get further locked down maybe quickly. And um, and uh, and again, the analysis that would not matter then once you once you do reach that dip. We still want right. to understand whether we have demand deficiencies there. But I wholeheartedly agree. And I know you've done work about uncertainty, so that would be one way to think about uncertainty or the future kind of bad news shock hitting you today. Yeah. Good. Um, next, we're going to go to Narayana Kochalakota. Narayana, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, thanks for calling on me. Great presentation, really informative. Uh, you know, it simplifies a lot of things to shut down, um, to have prices be completely rigid. I, or, there's no reference to inflation at all, I guess, in your analysis. Um, is there a way to be thinking about inflation as a, as a marker of whether or not we're in a a traditional supply shock setting, or uh, or or more a demand uh, or a supply shock causing a, a demand uh, um, demand scarcity. 
Yeah, it, it is something missing in the presentation and something less missing in our analysis than in our presentation. We've thought a little bit about that. Um, here's two, two ideas I would, would say. First of all, um, in the very short run, I think with all this stockpiling at the households, you get this increase in demand and maybe increase in prices that is not, uh, you know, modeled here. Obviously, we don't have durable, the durable aspect of that kind of phenomena. Um, and, um, and, but, but, so that would be one thing playing against uh, seeing deflationary pressures. Another th concept, this is more conceptual that what I find interesting is we talk about the CPI. When we're solving this model, actually, the inflation rate, you know, like there is an ideal price index that's going on and the shutdown itself is already raising the prices. So basically, you know, if you think this is a more technical point, but you know, what's the right inflation rate? If suddenly I can't buy some goods. Well, those goods, their price are infinity. So how are we going to do that? And I don't know, you know, I guess what statistical uh, agencies are doing is just keeping track of the prices that are still available. But, um, but you know, so the way we're thinking is the consumer's price for restaurants is infinity now or something. Um, if, um, so, so that's more a conceptual point that you also will have to discuss what is the right measure of inflation a little more. Um, but I don't have a full answer on that, but we have been thinking about that. Those are two thoughts we, that we had, but I agree that it's a nice, interesting thing to go further and think about, uh, the inflation implications. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's really helpful. I, I'll just add quickly that I hope you're right that this is a, a transitory episode. I, I, uh, worry that, uh, the response to it, well, uh, you know, the pandemic itself might fade, uh, the responses to it in terms of restrictions of various kinds across countries um, or even within countries might persist for quite some time. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, there's many dimensions of the problem. We've we focused on this one, the more macro sure. ish. There's productivity, long run growth, or even cultural differences that will be mm -hmm. impacted. I agree. Uh, and that's very interesting. OK. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So we're sort of coming up uh, towards the time constraint now. So I think maybe we'll wrap up. So uh, thanks a lot to Ivan and co-authors for this uh, uh, very stimulating paper. And let me just uh, forewarn everybody that we actually have three talks next week. Um, so we have a talk on uh, Tuesday by Sergio Correa, Stefan Luc, and Emil Werner on pandemics, depressed economy. Thursday, Marty Eichbaum, Rebello, and Trevant on macroeconomics of epidemics. And then we have um, a more micro talk on, uh, on Friday uh, by Lone Smith, uh, Mariana Kudliak, uh, for whom the bell tolls, which is uh, trying to understand uh, behavior in a uh, SIR model. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, thanks to everybody for participating. Uh, have a good evening. Bye. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to all the audience. Thanks. Bye. Stay safe, everyone.